Great. Welcome, everyone. We'll just uh, give a couple minutes here for people to join. Looks like it's filling up. Great, why don't we get started then? Uh, I guess, welcome everyone. My name is Kunal Falf. I'm Chief Commercial Officer here at Lifecycle. Uh, welcome to the latest in our, our webinar series, uh, which uh, will be conducted primarily by Tim Johnson, our, our executive chairman and one of the co-founders of the company. Uh, I think he'll take us through 35, 40 minutes uh, of the presentation. We'll have some time for live Q&A at the end. So. Just ask that if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. I'll also in parallel, uh, if there's questions that can easily be answered by text, I'll, I'll be responding in parallel and we'll save some uh, questions for Tim at the end. So I'll turn it over to Tim to take us uh, through the new era of lithium ion battery recycling. Thank you very much, uh, Kanal. And thank you everyone for signing in to Another life cycle webinar. My name is Tim Johnson. I'm the executive chairman and one of the co-founders here at Life Cycle. Uh, by way of personal introduction, just so you get a little bit more of a background of, of myself, uh, I joined Life Cycle as the co-founder in 2016. Uh, but prior to that, uh, I worked uh, for over a decade in the uh, lithium industry, primarily focused on the production of lithium chemicals. Uh, as a mechanical engineer and CFA charter holder, I had the pleasure of helping clients around the world uh, develop uh, assets primarily for, from mining and natural resources uh, through to chemicals that go into batteries as we know them today. What was clear during that time, however, that whilst there was a, a growing need for the chemicals and the materials that go into batteries, that there wasn't a good solution for recycling. Uh, what was going to happen to all the waste materials that are generated as we produce these batteries? What's going to happen to the batteries at the end of their life? There was very little that was being done in this way. And so in 2016, RJ Kocher, our CEO, and my fellow co-founder left our careers in order to start Lifecycle. Uh, fast forward almost five years, and, and here we sit with two commercial facilities uh, and another facility in late stage development. I'm going to take you through a little bit about the, the life cycle journey uh, as we sort of step through this. Very much looking forward to, to the q and I'll make sure that I provide plenty of time to address those at the end. To give you a high level overview of what I'll be talking about today, I'm going to start with the market opportunity. This is uh, an area that a lot of you will be already familiar with. And so I'll just touch on this briefly. And, and help set the tone for, for why we chose to target this specific problem. Then I'm going to talk about some of the alternative and historic methods for recycling lithium-ion batteries. Of course, lithium-ion batteries have been part of our lives since the early 90s. And so what was happening to these materials before life cycle came along? And what are some of the alternative methods and approaches that are being implemented uh, around the world to address the issue of waste lithium-ion battery materials? And then I'll talk specifically about life cycle. What is our technology? We refer to this as the spoken hub processes and I'll talk uh, and explain a little bit more about that as we get into that part of the presentation uh, to round it out before we go into Q and A. Before we start, I just want to start here. You know, why did we create life cycle? It really comes down to what we state in our vision and our mission. Uh, we, we aim to be the most sustainable, vertically integrated and globally preeminent lithium ion battery resource recovery company. A couple of things to point out in our vision statement, you'll notice that we don't use the word recycling. We see ourselves as a resource recovery company. Recycling is part of the function of what we do, but our goal is always to make sure that the important and critical materials that exist within lithium ion batteries are sustainably produced and returned back to the battery industry. It's a key focus of life cycles vision. And then our mission, of course, is to provide, this, provide sustainable and safe customer-centric solutions and technology to solve the global end of life cycle lithium-ion battery problem 
and slash opportunity to meet the rapidly growing demand for critical battery materials. The thing I would like to point out about our mission is that whilst in many parts of the world, the issue of uh, battery waste and end of life batteries is seen as a problem. We're really looking at this as an opportunity as we address this critical shortage as we see going forward for battery materials and see how life cycle plays an important role as part of that overall process. Of course, we're not just about the recovery of critical materials. That's an important part of our story, but really life cycle sits at the center of three key major revolutions that are happening around the world today. The first is our EV revolution. Uh, I'm sure most of you on the phone and uh, watching today would appreciate that we're going through a drastic and uh, deep change in terms of how we move around the world and how transportation is conducted uh, with the proliferation of electric vehicles. Of course, recycling and the, the supply of those critical materials is an important part of that function. Domestic supply of strategic materials, inherently recycling, resource recovery is a localized problem in the sense that there is waste that is produced domestically. One of the really exciting parts about this part of the, the story is that when you look at company, countries like the United States, for example, which is a disproportionate consumer of critical materials relative to producer, this is where recycling and resource recovery can come into play in order to help balance out that disequilibrium. And life cycle is right at the center of that. And then of course, we can't talk about this. All these things are vital when it comes to uh, our ESG goals. And this comes back to our environmental and sustainability objectives. Uh, this comes back to the world that we live in today and the desire to leave it in a better condition in which we found it. Of course, we're on a trajectory that is leading to the devastation of different habitats around the world, clean energy, the EV revolution. This is all part of what we see as being the future of the world and what we really need uh, as, a, as a society, as, a, as countries, as a civilization. I do have to apologize. There is a little bit of construction noise in the background. One of the uh, aspects of our working from home policy uh, at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, I will try and continue to uh, pass it, but if it gets too too much, I'll, uh, I'll ask one of my colleagues to, to help. So coming back to life cycle, uh, you know, with, uh, with those things in mind, you know, we do then have a number of key uh, pillars that we stand upon in terms of how we actually perform these operations. It starts with health and safety. Health and safety is important for our employees. It's important for our stakeholders. And we see it as being a critical part of our overall operation and then how we do business from a day-to-day -day perspective. In everything that we do, we seek to provide the best environmental solution for the, uh, the problem in which we're addressing, the recycling of lithium-ion batteries. Our facilities don't produce any wastewater uh, we've been very deliberate in making sure that we minimize water consumption and we maximize recycling, but also limit the potential for any harmful releases from any facilities that life cycle is associated with. And hence why we've implored a zero wastewater pro policy, uh, along with uh, no direct uh, emissions uh, and no non-landfilling policy for our materials. Serving our customers is center to what we do. And this is where uh, the integration of our quality, health and safety and environmental policies come into play. Uh, I'm very happy to say that I, uh, Lifecycle is ISO certified for 9001, 14001 and 45001, as well as R2 setting the global benchmark for recycling practices around the world. Of course, we're continuing to, to meet those customer specific requirements as part of what we do. This is not just how we operate, but this is also what we produce. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And then we can't talk about lithium ion batteries if you're not talking about continuous improvement. The industry continues to evolve and develop and life cycle is on the cutting edge of supporting our clients as they continue to evolve and develop. This is just a quick snapshot of uh, where we're up to today. 
Uh, we have two commercial facilities, as I touched on uh, earlier. The first one that we built was in Kingston, Ontario. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, this uh, part of the world, it's about halfway between Toronto and Montreal. Uh, we then built a second facility. It was our first US facility in Rochester, New York. And now where we're up to is uh, we're in the process of rolling out our third spoke facility, uh, which is going to be located in the southwest of the United States. Uh, and you'll see more news coming out about that in the coming weeks. We also are in the late stage development of our first hub. These terms are all going to make a lot more sense as we get into the presentation. Uh, and of course, we have many more facilities being rolled out across the, the coming years. So with that, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the, the market opportunity. As I said, most of you will be aware that we're going through a massive revolution when it comes to electric vehicles and how we move around the world today. Uh, we're seeing the rapid growth in demand uh, and production of electric vehicles, which is in return resulting in a demand for lithium ion batteries. What does that actually mean from a life cycle perspective? is that in the process of producing these batteries, it's not just the end of life materials, the, the dead batteries at the end of the process that we're concerned about. It's also all the scrap and manufacturing waste that's generated during the production of these materials. Uh, like any manufacturing process, these processes are not 100% efficient. There's things that are off cuts. There are materials that don't meet quality control specifications. And so what we do is we actually take that material and once again, we're turning it back into materials that can go directly back to the battery industry. Uh, of course, you know, we would argue that you can't have an EV revolution without recycling. Uh, lithium ion batteries can't be landfill. Uh, the historic ways, which we're going to talk about in a moment for processing lithium ion batteries are unsustainable, both from an economic and environmental perspective. So it's important that the world adopts and continues to grow uh, in support of efficient recycling of lithium ion batteries. And of course, the domestic supply of materials, which I've already, already touched on, and we'll get into a little bit more detail here. This is something that we'd like to share with people. It just talks about the evolution of, of lithium ion batteries. It's a great uh, pictorial that sort of describes how quickly this uh, market is evolving. But also as we look forward, it's not just our cars and our automobiles that we're focusing on when it comes to electrification. As, you'll, as I'm sure most of you are aware, there's many companies now looking into electrification of all different types of transportation, um, you know, be it uh, land going, air going or sea going. There's all different forms of applications that are gonna require lithium ion batteries in the future, which just further increases the demand and the for a recycling solution. So where does this culminate? This ultimately culminates in the incoming tsunami of spent lithium ion batteries. And the key thing that where Lifecycle comes into is how will these batteries be addressed and how will this waste be addressed? But before we get onto that, let me talk a little bit about some of the historic uh, methods of, uh, for recycling lithium ion batteries. So when RJ and I decided to, to leave our careers to start Lifecycle, we looked around and we were like, well, what is happening to lithium ion batteries today? Um, the reality is here in North America, many of the lithium ion batteries, uh, once they reach a, uh, a waste processing facility or, or similar, were being exported. Uh, and we still see a, a large volume of, of batteries being exported out of North America. Uh, Lifecycle continues to gain market share and capture this market, but that was a very common uh, path for batteries uh, in North America. Once overseas, there was less transparent markets in terms of how these materials were being dealt with, but essentially the idea was to get rid of the problem. Another issue that we saw around uh, North America was this concept of, of putting batteries into traditional waste uh, systems. And you know, this is not, uh, something that um, has gone away completely. We still see that, but now these facilities are becoming better equipped to, to deal with these. But we've seen uh, many fires within what we call MERF facilities, which are material recovery facilities. 
whereby lithium ion batteries are getting mixed in with materials where they shouldn't be, they end up uh, being damaged, catching fire and setting fire to the other materials that are around them. Uh, life cycle by providing a dedicated process to address uh, these materials, we're actually being able to reduce the amount of materials that ultimately end up in these facilities which are ill-equipped to handle them. Reuse. Uh, I'm going to touch on this in a little bit more, but just to say that you know, reuse is, we see this as, as part of the, the program going forward, but there's some uh, very clear arguments as to, to why we don't see this being a, a dominant factor uh, in the future of lithium ion batteries, but will still remain a, an important part. I'm going to touch on this in a bit more detail in a moment. And then finally, if it was recycled, it was being recycled in an inefficient, high temperature fashion. And, and that's the part that I want to focus on here. So historically, when people say that they were recycling lithium ion batteries, what were they doing? They were effectively heavily dismantling and discharging the batteries. They would then go through a number of processes. And these processes were never built specifically for lithium ion batteries. In fact, they were typically built for mineral processing. Uh, but like every you know, other type of uh, hazardous waste, uh, they found themselves in these types of facilities. The first step for once they'd gone through that process of, of disassembly and discharging would to end up in what we would call a calcining kiln. This is basically a high temperature oven. And what you're doing in this part of the process is you're burning off components that you don't want. Things like electrolyte, plastics, binders, these would be typically burnt off as part of this process. One of the key issues associated with this is these high temperature processes is that lithium ion batteries contain fluorinated materials. What does that mean? Fluorinated materials uh, is a compound or a group of compound uh, materials that are known as forever chemicals. Once put into the airstream, which was what happens when you burn them off, uh, they end up in our ecosystem, in our food chain, and as the name might allude to, they end up there forever and ultimately end up back in, in humans and they're very detrimental to human health. Uh, as a result, we've seen significant pushback around the world for fluorinated emissions. And in the US, for example, the Senate has brought down new legislation in the last 18 months, restricting the production of fluorinated emissions for this specific reason. So now we've got a semi-processed material where we've burnt off different components and now then goes across into another high temperature process. And this high temperature process, now we're burning off things like graphite, for example. Uh, lithium would typically be reported to the slag component, which is the waste component of this high temperature process, because what they were traditionally targeting was nickel, cobalt and copper. Uh, they were doing this because that is what we find in the Earth's crust. When we're talking about processing geological ore bodies, it's common to find nickel, cobalt, and copper together, and that's what these facilities were set up for. All those other materials, manganese and lithium, graphite, would be lost as part of this process. Of course, that wasn't the end of the, of the train, though. That nickel, cobalt, copper intermediate material then had to go on to another process to be refined, we call this a hydrometallurgical facility, whereby they're basically dissolving those metals back down in order to reproduce individual metals of nickel, cobalt, and copper. Those materials would then be sold, turned into materials like sulfates, for example, that can then go back into a battery. So as you can see, it's a very disaggregated, complex, expensive, environmentally harmful process that these lithium ion batteries were going through. And as you'll see with the life cycle process, we took a very different approach. But before we get there, I just wanna talk about some of the other methods that have come through uh, in more recent times. Uh, we talked about the smelting and thermal processing. Another process is referred to as cathode to cathode. Um, cathode to cathode is the process whereby you're taking one cathode chemistry and then you're reproducing it into the same cathode chemistry. Uh, we see this as being uh, a number of key issues. One of the things, as I touched on earlier, was the need to be nimble and flexible with the industry. Since the evolution of the lithium-ion battery in 1991, 
or the commercialization of the first lithium ion battery rather in 1991, we've seen the evolution and the evolving of many different types of cathode chemistries. So to say that by the time a vehicle, let's say that it lasts nine to 10 years on average, reaches the end of its life, the cathode chemistry that it was made with is likely out of date and based on history. So it would be very difficult to then find an appropriate market to return those materials back to the market. So we see a need to be flexible. Uh, of course, you know, uh, part of this process is also that you're only focusing on the cathode material. There's of course a whole range of different materials within the lithium ion battery uh, that we target as life cycle. As I said, I was gonna to touch a little bit more on reuse. Reuse will always, as we see it, have a role uh, in the lithium ion battery life cycle. Uh, we're, we're not saying that it won't be part of it. I think that it will continue to be part of it, but the business case for reuse has to keep, continue to decline as the cost of new lithium ion batteries has come down. As you can expect, when battery costs were very high, and you can look at this graph on the left-hand side here, when battery costs were very high for new batteries, the concept of taking a battery that maybe has still 80% of its useful charge capacity available at the end of its life, going through the testing and quality control process, and then remanufacturing it into new applications was attractive. However, what we've seen as the cost has come down so rapidly, the business case for doing that has reduced with it. Now, we estimate that the cost of, of reuse batteries is about 80 to you know, a bit over $80 per kilowatt hour. Uh, we see this being eroded uh, by comparison to new lithium ion batteries that are being produced. Another good example of this is that today, on average, approximately 70% of the cost of producing a new lithium ion battery is actually the cost of the raw materials. So when you're looking at it from a recycling perspective, you have a huge amount of value that you can capture from that end of life uh, battery as materials. And hence why we see this as a declining market, but it will still remain there. There are certain applications in which this is, is feasible and plausible um, but life cycle as an entity has decided to focus on the recovery of those important materials for the supply into the, uh, the new battery supply chain. Okay, so now I'm going to, just keeping an eye on time here, I'm gonna go into the life cycle process. We've talked a little bit about what other people are doing and what we saw in the industry when we first entered it. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the life cycle process. Life cycle has developed a, a two part process. We call this the spoke and the hub model. Uh, we break it up into these parts because it both follows the process, but then also our business model. At the spoke level, we process any format of lithium ion battery into intermediate materials. These facilities are specifically designed to be small, for, small footprint, small emission levels as we use no high temperature processing. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in a moment, low capital intensity, so that these facilities can be located close to where batteries are being generated. Of course, batteries, where batteries are generated is close to population centers. So it's important that you have a facility that is both uh, small in footprint, but small in environmental footprint, as nobody wants to have a smelter or a high temperature facility that's generating a lot of air emissions close to where they live. This also allows us to locate them with manufacturing facilities that are actually making new batteries and generating that manufacturing strap that I was referring to. That intermediate material, the key one that we're after, and you're gonna hear me use this term a few times, is black mass. Black mass is just the industry term that we give to anode and cathode materials from within the battery. It's a very unimaginative name. We call it black mass because those components are black and they come out as a, as a mass uh, product. What we do today is we sell these intermediate materials. As I said, we're in the late stage development of our first hub facility, which is to be located in Rochester, New York. What that will allow us to do is to convert that black mass back into those key materials that go back into lithium ion batteries. And I'll talk a little bit more 
about that process here shortly as well. But first, let me start with the spoke. Key things by comparison. One of the things that you'll notice about the life cycle process, in addition to no, having no thermal process, is that it's a very simple process. We've been able to engineer a solution. It's 100% owned by life cycle. Uh, we've been successful in having patents granted uh, in the United States and other jurisdictions around the world, whereby we can take any format of lithium ion battery. I always like to describe this as, think about the smallest possible lithium ion battery uh, all the way through to and including things like energy storage, uh, electric vehicle batteries and the like. We then process them in the state of charge in which we receive them. This is important because what we're doing is we're removing at least two processing steps in terms of disassembly and discharging. We then process them in a solution. We call this our neutralizing solution. It's a solution that, that we've developed. It's a water-based chemistry, and it's really tackling three key components. The first is if you have energy within a lithium ion battery because it has charge in it, where does that energy go? Well, it's released as thermal energy. And so by shredding in a solution, we're able to capture that thermal energy and distribute that through our system safely. The second part of it is that lithium ion batteries, as many of you will be aware, have the potential to catch fire if damaged. And of course, going through the process of breaking them up, you're damaging the batteries. But by doing it in solution, we're removing the presence of oxygen and therefore removing the potential for fire. And then thirdly, we're actually able to uh, chemically react the electrolyte that's within the battery in order to neutralize it. Hence part of the reason I call it a neutralizing solution to make it safe and easy to process through the rest of the plant. From there, we ultimately end up with three products. We have a shredded plastic product. This is predominantly the separator material from within the lithium ion batteries. And we send that on to other processors who then turn it back into reusable products. We have our metallic uh, content. This is predominantly copper and aluminum foils. This is the anode and cathode foils. It'll also include things like casing materials from the batteries as well. And we sell that as a copper and precious metals concentrate. And the key thing that we're after is that black mass material. That black mass material is what I was referring to earlier. That's the anode and cathode materials. So that's where the lithium and the nickel and the cobalt, manganese, they all reside within that black mass material. Within the system, all the water is 100% uh, recycled back through the plant. We don't discharge any wastewater. And because we don't have any thermal processes, we only have to do hygiene ventilation. Uh, so much like a, a nail salon, we have a system to capture uh, any, um, any stray um, VOCs that come off the process, they're neutralized uh, using activated carbon and release, therefore reducing any potential impact for, for environmental uh, releases. So why is this you know, so exciting relative to what's been done historically? Well, it starts off with our recovery rates. As part of this process, we're able to recover up to 95% of the components within the lithium ion battery. Uh, that's very important because as I was talking about earlier, when you go into a high temperature process, you're burning off a lot of the components, you're losing them as part of the process. And in the process, you're generating those uh, air emissions that we were talking about as well. Uh, these other components we've largely talked about uh, as well uh, in terms of fluorine emissions, we're targeting no solid waste uh, and no, no wastewater production from the facilities. Today, we sell our black mass material. Uh, life cycle has its own process. Once again, it's a patented process. We have, in addition to that, 12 formalized trade secrets that sit under these patents that then enable us to take that black mass and convert it directly into those key materials that go into lithium ion batteries. The Rochester hub, for example, will take the black mass, not just from one uh, spoke, but from multiple spokes. This comes back to the business model that I was referring to earlier, whereby we have multiple spokes close to where batteries are being generated. We then convert them into saleable products and in 
part reduce the mass of the key components that we're after, which is the black mass. And then we move it to a centralized facility where we benefit from economies of scale. And thinking back to that thermal process, you remember now we haven't done any pre-processing thermally thermal treatment. We're not doing any thermal treatment here. So there's no smelting process. We're going directly to the hydrometallurgical refining process. So we take that black mass concentrate in and we basically at a high level, we take the metals into solution. So once again, it's a water-based process and we go through and we systematically uh, remove or produce individual products that we can then sell back to the battery industry. Why is this so important? A couple of key things. There is no geological ore body today that exists that contains this full spectrum of materials. There's no ore body that contains graphite with lithium, with nickel, with cobalt. That ore body doesn't exist. So this is something that life cycle has had to develop. That chemistry is something that we've spent uh, a lot of time developing. We spent over $10 million developing and operating a demonstration facility in Canada to run this full flow sheet. And in doing so, we looked at this scale up risk. So how do you take a plant from a demonstration size to a commercial size, ensuring that you can achieve what you set out to achieve? Well, you do that by utilizing existing unit operations. What I mean by that is that if you look at each one of the unit operations to produce these individual materials, they're actually unit operations that we've adapted from other industries, predominantly the mining and refining industry. And we've applied them to this application. That means that there's no specially built equipment. We're not trying to recreate anything that hasn't already been done before. We're really about bringing it together to make it work in this format for this chemistry to produce these products. Of course, by having a centralized facility that produces this full spectrum of materials and skipping a number of those key traditional high temperature processing steps and the fact that we can now capture more of the product that comes out of the facility, including things like lithium carbonate, we can actually generate more revenue at a lower cost basis. So it ends up being a very economic way to treat this material. The key products that we produce from a battery perspective, the ones that are most important, the ones that, that uh, our customers, and, and I should point out that we're very fortunate to be supported by, by Traxxas, which has 100% offtake agreement for the key battery materials from the North American hub, the Rochester hub. Uh, is battery grade lithium carbonate. So this is lithium carbonate that's analogous uh, to anything that would be produced in the best refining facilities in the world. Same with nickel sulfate and cobalt sulfate. By going back to these key building blocks, we're future proofing any changes in chemistry. If you look at the changes in cathode chemistry over time, what you'll see is it's really the variations of the amounts of these different materials which is the predominant factor. And so by going back to these original building blocks, we can make sure that the products that we're producing are capable of going back into the battery industry at any point in time in the future. A couple of key things I'd just like to point out. Once again, high recovery rates, up to 95% recovery of the battery materials within the plant. Uh, no high temperature processing, so no meaningful amounts of, of air emissions. Uh, we're not producing any, uh, there's no tailings facility. One of the things that you know, we we're very proud of as, as part of the life cycle is by comparison to traditional mining assets, and, and this is that we will continue to need mining assets for, for some time, but we don't have the amount of waste that's generated from a mining asset because we're starting with a highly refined material coming in being the batteries. So we're able to make sure that we can get those materials back into the economy. One other thing that we'll point out, which will be uh, pertinent to some of uh, the people watching today is the fact that we can process lithium ion phosphate batteries. This is not something that's talked about a lot, but coming back to when you're looking at the traditional process of high temperature processing using traditional mining assets, targeting nickel and cobalt and copper. Well, of course, an LFP battery doesn't have nickel or cobalt. 
And there, from a, from a traditional recycling perspective, it had no economic value to those people choosing to recycle the materials in that way. But because we can produce battery grade lithium carbonate from our process, we're actually able to economically process LFP batteries. And once again, produce products that we can send back to the battery industry. Uh, not very many people know, but LFP batteries is not a new thing. This is actually quite an old chemistry. And today makes up you know, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the overall lithium ion battery market today. So it's a very significant portion of the overall battery market. Combine that with public announcements that have been made by the likes of Tesla, Volkswagen, BYD for the increase in focus on LFP batteries. We see this as being an important differentiator in the future. Coming back to sustainability, this is one of the, my favorite slides that we share with, with any investor or any group who's looking at the life cycle process is by comparison, you can see now not only can we produce materials that are as good, if not better than traditional mined materials, but we can also produce them in a way that is more environmentally conscious. By comparison, for every ton of batteries that Lifecycle recycles, we offset approximately five tons of CO2 emissions. But I think one of the most important parts of this slide is actually the bottom right one, and that's the water. A lot of people think about hydrometallurgical processes as being highly water intensive. We've been very careful to maximize the recycling of our water within our facilities and minimize water consumption. And so by comparison to a traditional uh, mining process and mining and refining process, for every ton of lithium ion batteries, we actually offset approximately 96 tons of water. And so by comparison, that's a reduction of 97% in terms of our valuable water uh, commodity. This is a little bit more, I just wanted to make sure that I touched on this properly, uh, back to our business model. Centralized hub built for scale, the ratio is actually 12 spokes to one centralized hub, moving those high value, easy to transport, safe intermediate materials to that centralized facility. That's life cycle today, where are we going? So in the next five years, we have 18 additional spokes to roll out around the world and four hub facilities, including the one in Rochester. We're able to be so aggressive with our execution plan because of how we've designed our facilities. Uh, one of the things that I, I failed to mention when I was talking through the spoke facilities is that these are standardized builds. So we've actually come up with a modular design whereby we can construct them, we test them locally, and then we transport them to where they need to go. A great example of that is our Rochester execution, whereby we were able to receive those modules on site in Rochester on the 3rd of November, and we were able to start commissioning on the 4th of December. That's approximately four weeks from the time the plant arrived on site to the time we were able to start it up and start running material through the plant. That's how we're going to be able to grow at the pace our customers need us to grow. Uh, as you'll see, the hubs become a very important part of our overall plan as we make sure that those materials that are generated from our spoke facilities uh, are processed and extracted in a way where we can maximize the amount of materials that we're returning back to the battery industry. And at the same time, generate the greatest economic return for the business. Okay, this is just to wrap it up now. Uh, we've talked about a number of these things. Uh, and so just to cap it off by comparison with incumbent technologies compared to the life cycle process, we are significantly cost advantage through the ability to process uh, batteries in the state of charge in which they arrive through all the way through to battery grade commodities while skipping a number of those traditional steps and maximizing the amount of materials that we actually generate, we're able to reduce that overall cost. We of course have much higher recovery rates and recycling efficiency rates because we're not uh, burning off materials as we go through the process. So there's both an environmental uh, aspect to that, but there's also an economic benefit associated with that. As I said, one of our core focuses within the organization is safety. 
by avoiding things like manually dismantling and discharging our batteries, we can process our batteries directly into the plant in a safe and autonomized way that significantly reduces the potential for risk to our workers. And then of course, the environmental impact. We've talked about it from the perspective of air emissions, from solid waste that's generated through the traditional processes. The life cycle processes and technologies have been deliberately designed. And this comes back to having a bespoke process that's dedicated to minimizing waste, minimizing air emissions, and making sure that we can process these batteries as efficiently as possible and get those materials back into new batteries. Going forward, uh, as I said, you'll, you'll see some more news come out uh, shortly about our, our third spoke in, in North America, which was going to be in the southwest of the United States. But of course, one of the most exciting uh, things that we have coming up is our first uh, commercial hub, uh, which we're looking to break ground on late this year uh, in, uh, in Rochester, New York. So with that, I'm going to stop because I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for, for questions and I'll turn it back to Kunal to, to moderate the Q&A time. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, there's a fair amount of questions. I've answered some live, but uh, left some of them related to your presentation here. So the first one, maybe broad level, uh, we have one question here. What are the main challenges or hurdles you see today for a development of a sustainable EV battery recycling industry? Yeah, I think one of the, the key challenges that we face today uh, on the EV side uh, is making sure from a life cycle perspective that we have the infrastructure in place that's capable of handling the materials as they're being generated. Uh, it's not good enough to start looking at these processes once these materials are already being produced because in fact, you're too late. So one of our key focuses within the organization at the moment is actually on the execution side. Uh, very fortunate that I'm supported by a great group of, of engineers and, and technical people who have experience in deploying these assets around the world. Uh, but we feel that the technology on the life cycle side is well understood. Now it's about how do we execute well? How do we achieve the promises that we've laid out before our customers? Great, thanks Tim. Uh, Next one, I mean, there's two questions here that are pretty similar, so I'll just read both of them for you, Tim. Uh, okay. One person asked what happens to the fluoride in your process. This is when you were going over that, that section of the presentation. And then uh, there's another question, how does your process specifically deal with PFAS? So maybe just combining those two, uh, you can talk a little bit more about the, the fluoride. Yeah, not a problem. So on the fluoride side of it, because we keep the temperatures low within the process, we avoid generating those fluorinated emissions. So fluorinated emissions come from when you volatilize materials that contain fluorines, and we keep it at a low enough temperature as to avoid that. That's the first step. The second step is, well, where does it go? As we said, we don't produce any wastewater, so it's not going out and out our wastewater. In fact, we actually chemically bind it uh, within the products that we produce in order to uh, basically reduce or remove the potential for it to be released uh, into the environment. So it's going out as, as part of those products. Great, thanks. Um, next one here is, you know, we talk about 95% recovery. Uh, one person here is asking, does that, is that only based on NMC chemistry and what is the percentage for iron phosphate? So I think you touched upon iron phosphate recycling, but maybe just to touch upon the recovery rates there as well. Yeah, not a problem. So the recovery rates that we're talking about actually apply to, to all chemistries. Uh, and so the, the process that we've designed is specifically uh, targeted at being able to handle the full spectrum of lithium ion batteries. When it comes to LFP batteries, it's a very interesting point. We actually see two strategies. First of all, if in general, if we get lithium ion batteries as part of LFP batteries, rather as part of our general black mass feed into the hub, we're able to handle those materials and that's fine. We recover the lithium, uh, et cetera. Uh, where we see part of our strategy in the future going forward is because LFP, particularly in Asia, is such a large dedicated stream that we actually have the potential to optimize our hub flow sheet. And this is work that is happening as we speak in order to be able to process LFP, but only black mass 
to produce those key materials that, that we target, particularly lithium carbonate. Uh, and by doing so, we can even reduce the cost of processing it further. Uh, and that's a very important point. Great, thanks. Uh, there's a question here also about the black mass. So what form or what molecule actually is stated is the lithium in, in the black mass? It's a more technical question for you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's getting very technical. And so most of the materials include the lithium, uh, some form of an oxide. We don't chemically change the form of the cathode material, which is where most of the lithium comes from. We do get some of the lithium coming through as a lithium salt from the electrolyte, uh, but we leave it in that form until it arrives at the hub facility. Once in the hub facility, we then pull it into solution. We dissolve it into solution as part of the initial leaching process, and then we handle it through the, the system that way. Great, thanks. And I think you've covered this to the extent we can. Uh, I think just to answer what, it, you know, there's a question about what is the neutralizing solution. We won't get into the details of what's in the solution, but uh, kind of related to the next question here is how do we separate the black mass from the current collectors without decomposing the binder? So maybe go back into the staying with the spoke here. Yeah, no problem. So this can I said, I won't give you the specific formulation for, for the neutralizing agent, but just to say that uh, what we're doing, as I said, the neutralizing agent is chemically treating the electrolyte. How we separate the black mass from the current collectors is actually mechanical. Uh, so what we're doing is we're mechanically separating the black mass from those current collectors rather than dissolving the binder. Got it. Uh, there's a couple questions here also on the hub. Um, one being, you know, we mentioned we're ex implementing existing hydrobet solutions in the hub, but do you see any room for improved processes, reducing reagents, uh, optimization, especially I think Tim, as we talk about future hubs, uh, which is also a question here. We talked about Asia hubs. Maybe you can integrate your answer. Uh, there's a couple questions here about your potential for European hubs? Yeah, okay, so pretty broad spectrum. And so let, let me address it, uh, first of all, from the perspective of optimization. As I said, you know, we always are looking for ways to improve. Uh, one of the benefits of running the large scale demonstration plant that we did uh, is that we were actually able to do a lot of that development work at that scale. And in doing so, we significantly reduce reagent consumption we're able to remove some reagents, for example. Uh, and so a lot of that work has been done. Uh, with the construction of the commercial scale hub, of course, we'll be looking for continued areas to improve and optimize the process. But a lot of that work has been done. As we roll out into to Asia and into to Europe, in Asia in particular, you know, I was talking about the LFP process, that's exactly part of what we're trying to do there is you know, because we have a dedicated stream of LFP black mass, uh, which is what we're working on right now, uh, is that uh, we're able to remove some of the key steps that are associated with things like nickel and cobalt because they're not there. And in doing so, we're optimizing the flow sheet, we're optimizing the amount of equipment and reagents that we're using as part of that process. At the moment, we're, we're not uh, explicitly uh, going forward with a, with a hub in, in Europe, but I, I would say that uh, that is definitely on our radar uh, as we continue to work with our partners and our customers uh, in, uh, in Europe and uh, in North America and Asia, we're, we're continuing to look at opportunities uh, in Europe uh, as an example. And so we will, uh, can't say when, but uh, we will continue to look at that as, a, as an opportunity. Exactly. Yeah, sticking with Europe, there's another question. Um, I think we show that we're going to build spokes there. And, and I guess the question here is what is the timing and where you know, specific countries? So I guess to the best we can comment, Tim, I'll let you handle that. Yeah, not a problem. So uh, as, as Canal's alluding to, uh, there's a number of things uh, currently under works, uh, but we're, we're not quite at a point where we're able to disclose them publicly. Uh, and so there will be more information coming forward uh, on this, but we have very, uh, a very broad approach uh, to our European strategy when it comes to partnering with, uh, and particularly partnering with groups who are already 
doing some level of collection or processing of lithium ion batteries, uh, but perhaps lack the, the technology and capability to uh, provide an efficient and scalable solution. Uh, so more information to, to come on that one in the not so distant future. Great, thanks, Tim. And maybe just ju jumping back to the, the hub side, there seems to be a lot of questions. One question that came up was, uh, maybe there's a quick one is, can we use uh, salt water or only has to be fresh or processed water in the, in the process? Uh, you know, good question. We're not actually uh, in Rochester, for example, we're not actually near the ocean. So uh, that's not a, an option for us there. Uh, you know, going forward, it would be, you know, potential. Uh, I think the reality is, is that uh, the chlorides that come in with the salt water would probably uh, be non-ideal. We'd have to, to treat that water first. Um, so, you know, not to say it's in, not possible, but it's not part of our base strategy. Got it. And... There's been a couple questions I see here also on the graphite. Can you comment, Tim, on, on the quality and, and what sort of products? Uh, I mean, we're working on this together uh, where we're trying to uh, put the material uh, or place the material. Yeah, for sure. So one of the things that um, the, when it comes to the graphite is that because we're processing mixed batteries, we end up with a mixture of natural and synthetic graphite. But also graphite is one of the components that actually changes from a physical perspective. So unlike the, the metals that are on the cathode side of a battery, whereby you can pull them into solution and you can reproduce them as products, graphite has physically, physical characteristics that have changed over the course uh, of the life of the battery. There are some groups doing some great work that are looking to take recycled graphite and, and put it back into to batteries. But as we see it, the graphite ends up actually being a byproduct that will go to other industries. Uh, so be it uh, steel or refractory or the like, uh, providing a recycled source for them to input to substitute naturally produced graphite. But in terms of going back into the batteries, that's one that uh, continues to be an area of focus for the industry as a whole. Uh, also, there's couple questions here then more specific to lithium in terms of uh, what is the recycling efficiency for lithium itself? I mean, similar question was how much of the lithium from the black mass? So I think you can answer both in, in one, one answer here, Tim. Yeah, no problem. So, so we get up to 95% uh, recovery of all the materials. Uh, on the lithium side, uh, it's slightly lower. It's, it's sort of in the range of about 85 to 95%. Um, this partially just because lithium is so much more reactive than some of the other materials, uh, but it's very, very high uh, recovery. We get uh, the vast majority of it back as lithium carbonate. Uh, the residual goes is would you end up in uh, in other products? That's ultimately what happens. That's where you end up with your losses. Great. Uh, I just I was trying to group them here. I missed that there was another question about the water post-processed uh, and are you closed loop? Is it eventually lost through evaporation or do you ultimately have to reject it into the water treatment systems of your municipality? So I think not yeah. specific to one tech, but maybe you cover it for both uh, processes. Yeah, no problem. So on the uh, spoke side, uh, we're actually slightly water negative. And so a spoke facility will consume somewhere between 250 and 500 tons a year of water. Uh, and that's, uh, that's water that we have to add in. All the other water uh, is recycled within the plant. We, we don't discharge wastewater at all. At the hub side of the facility, uh, once again, we don't discharge any water, so there's no periodic discharge to municipal wastewaters uh, or the like. Uh, we recycle um, the water through the plant. Uh, we end up with a small bleed to control impurities that we ultimately evaporate as, uh, as part of the process. Yep, great. Uh, another one here more forward looking is that obviously chemistries are changing. Uh, we have uh, this question specifically mentions lithium sulfur and then there's solid state. So uh, what's our approach or Tim on the technical side uh, when we look at these, uh, these new chemistries and, and forward looking 
changes in the industry. Yeah, in fact, actually, we're very excited about uh, these upcoming potential uh, new application batteries, if we want to talk about it in, in that way. As I said, you know, one of the uh, traditional issues with, uh, with graphite is that physical morphology. One of the benefits of having a, a lithium-based anode is that it increases the ability to recycle that material uh, and turn it back into materials that can go back into batteries. Uh, we, uh, we have our own process. Uh, it's a patent pending process for recycling solid state batteries. Uh, and we definitely see that as part of our roadmap going forward. Great. Uh, interesting question here, because uh, we uh, talk about this pretty often. <laughs> I mean, it, what is the <laughs> classification of black mass in the US, waste or not waste? And because uh, I know in different jurisdictions, you know, different classifications, and we can talk a little bit about how we address this. Yeah, not a problem. So actually in, uh, in New York, where we have our facility in, in Rochester, we went through the process uh, with the DEC to actually get what we call a beneficial use determination. So what that is, is a process whereby you can uh, nominate a material or a product to be assessed as for its beneficial use to determine as to whether or not it's a product or a waste material. Uh, and we were successful in being able to have black mass uh, recognized as a product within New York. Uh, and so that's how we treat the material uh, at our facility. Great. Uh, somebody, I think there's a follow-up question here to uh, next generation batteries. There's a lot of discussion around silicon-based anodes as well. Uh, can your process be adapted to the lack of carbon in the battery? Uh, to create lithium carbonate is the specific question. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the lack of graphite in the battery doesn't uh, affect our ability to recover the cathode materials. Uh, you know, from a silica perspective in particular, I mean, the reality is we already see silica uh, in the anodes today. Uh, a lot of the, the new age or the newer formulations of battery chemistries will include some level of silica as part of the the graphite or anode mixture uh, already. So it's, uh, it's definitely something that, uh, that we've done and uh, we're capable of doing uh, and doesn't affect our uh, end products from that perspective. Got it. And uh, maybe I'll leave you with one last one, Tim. There's some good questions here that we could also respond by email if you send an inquiry mm -hmm. to us uh, directly through our website. But uh, there are a couple questions on purity of lithium. So maybe you can comment on the grade of lithium we've produced to date. Yeah, not a problem. So we've been able to successfully produce uh, and have qualified battery grade uh, lithium carbonate from our process. Uh, this is an important part of life cycles technology is our ability to produce that battery grade material. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I'm very proud of as, uh, as one of the co-founders is that, you know, when you look at recycled materials from the life cycle process, they're on par if not better than the best products that are produced globally. Uh, and lithium is included in, in that, uh, that statement. Uh, and so when we look at it from a long-term sustainability perspective, there's really no limit to the number of times we can recycle a lithium ion battery and produce products that can go back into new lithium ion batteries. Thanks, Tim. And uh, I think lithium is a good point to, to conclude here on. Uh, we thank everyone for joining. Uh, we still have a fair number of participants. If there's outstanding questions, uh, we encourage you to reach out to us directly uh, and someone from our team will uh, will respond. And, and thanks everyone for their time and thanks Tim for, for the presentation. I don't know, Tim, if you wanna make any concluding remarks. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Kanal. Thank you everyone for making the time to, to join our webinar here. Uh, if you do have questions or questions that didn't get answered, uh, please encourage you to, to submit them via our website. Uh, one of our team would be more than happy to, to come back to you and, uh, and answer them. Great. Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Perfect. Thank you, everyone.